Hi, good afternoon. My name is Warren Dow. I am one of the principal contributors to the Real Estate Technology Institute. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we are absolutely excited to have Andy Tolbert uh, coming to us from saferagent.com today. Um, Andy has been involved in the real estate and mortgage industry since 1995 and uh, over the years has developed saferagent.com, which is designed to help keep realtors safe both physically and digitally. Um, today's presentation, Andy is going to be covering a lot of uh, physical safety tips that uh, every realtor can take advantage of. It is, September is Realtor Safety Month, so it becomes uh, really important for us to pay attention and, and really just well, let's see what Andy has to say. I don't want to uh, step out of turn here. <laughs> So, Andy, first of all, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for inviting me on. Oh, absolutely. Um, Andy will be coming back in a couple weeks talking uh, with us about a little bit more focused on the digital safety side of things, uh, which, again, we're very excited to have you back twice. No, I'm, not, I'm not covering the digital. I'm covering open houses and vehicle safety. Oh, okay. Well, even better, that works, too. Um, there are a lot of places where we can stay safe and um, or need to stay safe in this industry. So I'm really glad that you're sharing what you do know. So before we get started with your presentation, uh, you know, there have been a lot of um, safety concerns over the last year, and it seems like it's getting more and more scary out there. Um, do you have any, um, I guess, stats that you might be able to share to kind of set the framework of why this is so important? I do. There's actually two different organizations that collect statistics on uh, realtor safety, realtor injuries, and realtor fatalities on the job. One of them is actually our federal government. It's the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And every year they do a report on fatalities on the job broken down by SIC code, which SIC code is basically the different codes for different employment. And in the real estate SIC code, which is 531, in case you're wondering, under the real estate professional SIC code in the last 10 years from 07 through 16, we're always a year or two behind on the report, so it takes a while to tally up, there were 576 real estate professionals that died on the job. Oh, wow. In 10 years. So that's an average of about 57 a year, 58 a year. But how many have we heard about in the last 10 years? Most of us have only heard of one or two. Wow. That's so, some, those are some pretty serious stats. Um, and in your experience, or do you know off the top of your hand, are, are these generally in urban areas? Are these in more rural areas? Is there any common theme across? You know, it's kind of funny you should ask that because I'm in a lot of different real estate. I am a real estate broker too, just so everybody knows. I've had my license for about 20 years and I'm out there. I work with buyers and sellers just like you guys do. I'm an active agent. And I'm in a couple of different Facebook groups. And every time somebody posts anything about a question about safety, um, somebody always tags me. And I, I love reading the comments. And I see people say, oh, well, I live in a rural area, so I don't have to worry about it. And then five comments down, somebody says, well, I live in an urban area, so I don't have to worry about it. But the second group that does statistics is actually the National Association of Realtors. And once a year in September, they release a survey. It's basically, they ask a bunch of real estate agents a questionnaire and they release the report. It's called the Annual Realtor Safety Report. And in that, one of the questions says, have you ever felt unsafe on the job? And then the follow-up to that is, was it in a urban, suburban, or rural area? And the answers are almost equal. There is no, you know, well, urban's way up here and rural's, there is none of that. They're almost straight across the board equal. So it does not matter where you are. So what that tells me is no matter where people are coming from on today's webinar, everybody should be paying attention to what you have to say. Yep. And about a quarter of all attacks on a real estate agent are a male agent. So males are not immune either. Hmm. Interesting. Although when I teach a class, it's usually about 99% females, and every now and then I've got one or two guys sitting in the back of the room. So very few of them come to class. However, a quarter of the attacks are on a male agent. 
So, and how long have you been, or how long ago did you develop saferagent.com? Um, we're probably going on about four years now. Okay. A little over four years. What happened is my family, I grew up actually, my family owned a gun store. So I grew around, I grew up around firearms and self-defense. Um, I'm also a real estate investor. My husband and I fix and flip houses. So I'm often out looking at houses myself. I don't have a customer with me if I'm shopping for myself. And I, we ran into a few different situations at some vacant houses. And that's probably... 13, 14 years ago. And that's when my husband and I kind of said, you know what, we need to, we need to start taking training. We started taking self-defense training and different things. In my other life, besides being an agent, I'm also a real estate instructor and I've been teaching continuing ed classes for about 15 years. And about four or five years ago, somebody came to me and said, you need to take your self-defense world over here that we know you don't talk about much in your real estate life and your instructor world, and you need to put these two together. We need this. Well, that makes that's, sense. That's kind of where it came from. Oh, great. Well, I'm really excited to see what you have to uh, share with us today. So with that being said, please take it away. Awesome. And before I hop into my presentation, I want to give you the breakdown of that 576 oh, please. agents that were killed in 10 years. Ready for this? 250 of them were violence at the hands of another or an animal. They in, now remember these categories are across every industry. So whether you're a coal miner or a forest firefighter, they use the same categories. So 250 of them were violence at the hand of another or an animal. Uh, 118 were transportation incidents. So that means car accidents. We're in our cars a lot, so that makes us more susceptible. Here's one that might surprise you. 120 of those were slips, trips, and falls. Really? Yeah. So 120 over 10 years. One real estate professional a month in the United States is dying from a slip, trip, or fall. Wow. That's, that's scary. 49% were exposure to toxic or harmful substances. Or not 49%, 49 of the fatalities. So, you know, we go into houses with mold. We go into houses that maybe were uh, meth houses or crack houses. All of that, especially if you already have allergies or you have a low immune system, sure. stuff like that can be fatal. And that's proven that basically we have about five a year die from that. Wow. And then 24 or other um, contact with equipment things like that. It, so it's a small, uh, I think like five or six were fires or explosions on the job. So not, that's kind of like getting struck by lightning. It's not a real high right. likelihood. But what is a real high likelihood is slips, trips, and falls, vehicle accidents, and violence at the hands of another. And that's the one we're going to talk about today is avoiding the violence at the hands of another, at least as, as much as it can be avoided. You can't avoid anything 100%. Sure. Okay. So let's see. Is everybody seeing my screen? We're going to. Okay. So what we're going to talk about today is how to be and stay a safer agent. And one of the things I like to say safer, because I don't want you to think there's nothing you can do to be 100% safe. It does not matter how prepared you are. Something can always happen. But if you take what we're gonna talk about in the next, I don't know, 60 minutes or so. And if you just implement a few of them, you'll definitely be safer. And what we're gonna talk about isn't just applicable to on the job. It also works when you stop at the 7-Eleven to get your Slurpee or your coffee this morning. It works when you go out to a restaurant with your family. It works when you go out to Walmart grocery shopping at midnight because we just got out of some meeting. So the skills that we're talking about are useful everywhere. And as you can see there on the screen, my name is Andy Tolbert. It is Andy with a Y, don't be confused. Now, what we're going to talk about is not appropriate for everyone. We're going to talk about a lot of different things that you can do. And some of them you're going to hear and go, oh, that is a genius. I'm going to do that. And others you're going to hear and go, you know, that just doesn't click with me. So I'm not going to do that one. And that's fine. The more of them that you implement, 
the better you're going to be. It's going to make you and your family and your customers that much safer. Legalities. Uh, I'm in Florida and Florida is pretty lenient when it comes to self-defense, but I know some of you are in other states and you need to learn the laws in your own states. Even something as simple as a pepper spray can be restricted depending on what state and believe it or not, even what city you live in. So for example, the city of Chicago and the state of Illinois have different laws about what you can and can't do as far as self-defense tools. So you've got to figure out what's legal in your area. That being said, I am not giving legal advice. So I did not, I'm not an attorney. I don't pretend to be one. I did not stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. So please go talk to, for starters, talk to your broker. Um, number one should, if somebody says, can I do this on the job? Number one should be go to your broker. And number two should be get legal advice if you've got questions. And like I said at the beginning, our intent, I'm not going to make you an expert. I'm not turning you into a ninja tonight. Basically, all we're doing is showing you some things that you can implement. And if you implement a few of those and you stack them up on top of each other, they're going to protect you and everybody that's with you. If I walk into a house and I'm not paying attention and we walk in on a meth head who's strung out and has a machete in his hand, if I'm alone, that's one thing. But I, if I have a customer and her small children with me, I've now walked them into that dangerous situation too. So protecting us is also protecting our customers. And I want you to keep that in mind. And now I'm, my screen doesn't want to advance again. We're having fun today with this. I don't know what's going on. Let's pause it, resume it. There we go. Okay. Make sure it didn't skip anything. So one of the basic things that we talk about in self-defense training is the levels of awareness. And maybe you've even heard of Jeff Cooper's um, color codes. What we're going to talk about today is unaware aware, alert, and alarm. Unaware, you've seen this person. They've got their nose stuck in their cell phone. They're probably walking through the parking lot and they would trip over a shopping cart because they don't see it right in front of their face. If you, I, I want you, the next time you're out in any public place, whether it's a restaurant or a grocery store, I want you to just stop, put your phone away and look around at what's happening around you. And once you do that, you're going to look at people and go, man, if I was a bad guy, I would pick you because you're not paying attention to anything at all around you. I could steal your car. When I, I love this. When I teach a live class, I ask the class, in the last 30 days, not ever in your whole life, in the last 30 days, how many of you have been at a grocery store and you've seen a shopping cart with somebody's purse in the basket, wide open with their wallet hanging out of it. And usually at least half of the hands go up in the classroom. And that's just in the last 30 days. So when people are unaware, listen, I am not condoning crime in one way, shape or form. And I am never, ever, ever saying that somebody deserved what they got. We are never going to stop crime. The only thing we can do is make ourselves look like a harder target so the bad guy goes up the street and picks somebody else. We can make ourselves look like a harder target. We can make our vehicles look like a harder target. And we can make our houses look like a harder target. Because if we're not an easy target, the bad guy will move on and go pick somebody else. And if we leave our purse unattended in our shopping cart wide open with our wallet hanging out, we have just made ourselves a super duper duper easy target. And that's what unaware is. We're just completely oblivious. We're not paying attention to what's around us. And unfortunately, that's what the bad guys are looking for. Aware is one level up from that. It's very simple. Put your phone away anytime you're in what we call a transition area. If I'm sitting at my desk, I can play on my phone. If I'm sitting on my sofa, I can play on my phone. But when I'm walking from the front door of Walmart out to my vehicle, we should be paying attention to what's around us. And at AWARE, that's all we're doing is looking. Oh, look, there's a guy sitting on the bench over there. Oh, look, there's a van parked on the same aisle I am. 
We're not making any judgments. We're not calling 911. We're just paying attention to our surroundings. Alert is one level up from that. So, okay, the guy on the bench is looking at me a little funny. The hair on the back of my neck is going up. Have you ever gotten that feeling that the hair on the back of my neck? We're just paying attention. Okay. Guy on the bench looking at me funny. Car, the van is parked right next to my car and it's running. Okay. Something in our body is telling us we should pay a little more attention. Something's just not right. And then alarm is one step up from that. The guy has gotten off the bench and he's running towards us or I'm trying to get into my car and all of a sudden the side door of the van has got thrown open and there's a guy with a mask there. So at this stage, alarm is basically when we recognize that something is about to happen and we need to decide what you're going to do about it. And what we can do about it is basically something we learned back in probably about third or fourth grade in biology class, and that's fight or flight. What happens out in the plains of Africa when the lion and the gazelle meet? And there's two things that can happen. One is we can fight, which is literally that. We can fight back. Now, it's not likely that a gazelle is going to fight a lion because it's such a mismatched fight. However, maybe a lion would fight a tiger because they're a more evenly matched. It also depends on how long has it been since they've eaten last. Maybe one of them has babies with them. That changes the dynamic. Maybe one of them has been injured. So they're less likely to want to get into a fight if they're currently injured. And one of the things that we like to talk about is a fight is never your best option. Flight, which just simply means run away, is your best option. It's not cowardly. It's nothing except self-preservation. I get to go home and sleep in my own bed tonight because I ran away from a bad situation. And Hollywood has kind of glorified fights. That's not what it's all about. Fights are dirty. Fights have no rules. And the bad guy is just trying to get an upper hand on you so he can do whatever else it is he wants to do, whether that's rob you, steal your car, rape you, kill you, whatever it is, he's trying to put you at a disadvantage so he can win whatever he wants. The challenge, I can sit here and tell you to run away every single time, but the challenge is sometimes you can't. You might find yourself cornered in a situation. You might find yourself in a room with only one entrance and exit. So you've got to know enough fighting skills to get away to be able to run. Or, as what usually happens, you don't even realize you're in a fight until somebody's jumped you from behind and sucker punched you. So maybe your first clue you're even in a fight and your jaw's already broken because somebody hit you from behind. So we've got to have some basic self-defense skills in amongst everything else. But what we're going to talk about more today is not even putting ourselves into these situations to start with where we would have to make a decision like this. Now, fight or flight are two of the ones that we um, respond to. And it's actually built in our DNA, and it's a physical response. We have physical things that happen to our body. Our heart rate, our, we start to sweat, we start to breathe shallower, our pupils dilate. The blood actually leaves our extremities, like our fingertips to move into our bigger muscles so we're prepared to run away or to fight. These are all physiological responses to the fight or flight. Now, the bad guy is having these too. He's just having them a little ahead of you because he knows what's about to happen. You don't yet. But there's a third one that is built in our DNA too, and that is freeze. Okay? So we physically freeze. Now, at some point in history, freeze might have worked well. But have you heard of the term a deer in the headlights? How did that work out for the deer? Not so well. So freeze. If you're out in the woods at night and a bad guy's chasing you, hold really, really still. Because at night, motion is what people can sense with their vision. However, if a bus is barreling down at you, freezing is probably not a great idea. Another one people talk about is comply. Just do whatever the bad guy says and then he'll leave you alone. The challenge is 
you, you can't. You cannot talk a bad guy out of what he's going to do. And one of the things we always, if all he wants is your wallet or your purse, give it to him. If all he does is takes your purse and runs away, you have won that encounter. Trust me. We don't want to escalate to anything further. And there shouldn't be anything in your wallet or purse that's that valuable that you can't replace it. But if the person ever asks you to get in a vehicle, you know, hey, get in the car and I won't hurt you, do not do it. Your chances of survival go down immensely. Whatever it is they want to do to you, they don't feel they can do it here. So they need to take you to a different location. And in my world, that's never a good choice. Now, another thing that we talk about in response to a situation is scream versus yell. And to me, a scream is a very, I like to joke and say a scream is the last thing that always happens to the lady right before she gets killed in every B horror movie. She does the, the weak, ah! I'm helpless, somebody needs to come help me, and never mind, I'm dead as opposed to a yell, which we like to call the bad dog yell. In fact, I want the yell with the hand sign where you're actually putting your hand up, the universal sign for stop. Every country, every place in the world, that is the universal sign for stop. The reason we're doing this, we're, we're showing our assertiveness, we're showing our confidence, we're showing the bad guy that we are not an easy victim. But the other thing we're showing is with our hand in the stop position is we're showing every camera that might be watching what's happening. We told them to stop, they continued coming at us. Especially if you carry a firearm, that can be really important because if all the camera sees is you pulled your gun and shot somebody, how do we prove that was self-defense? But if a camera shows me telling them to stop first, that changes the entire dynamic of that case. And it's really sad that we have to think that way but that's my job is to get your brain thinking that way, okay? Now, if you're in a fight, what are some of the potential outcomes? And I really want you to think about this. It doesn't matter what your skill level is. You can be a ninja warrior, Navy SEAL assassin, but everybody can get taken by surprise and everybody has a bad day and what if you're a Ninja Warrior Navy SEAL assassin, but you just had knee surgery, so you have a, a cast on your leg and you're walking on, on crutches? That makes you not a great fighter today. But no matter what your skill level is, you could end up with injuries or worse death, medical bills, hospital stay, rehabilitation afterwards. Um, I know somebody, he was in his 70s, he was a, a landlord, he wasn't a realtor, but he was a landlord, and he got attacked in one of his rentals once. And he was, they basically beat him almost to death. They think it was a gang initiation. And he was in intensive care for three weeks. So how does being in intensive care for three weeks affect you? How does it affect your family? How does it affect your income if you're not working for three weeks? By the way, you don't get out of intensive care on the 22nd day and you're back to work. You move to regular care, and then you move to in-home care, and then it, that could be a year or more, or never. Depending on what the attack is, you may never recover from it. Financial loss, time off of work. How about emotional? What about the emotional impact on you, impact on your family? Some people end up with PTSD after an attack situation. How about attorney's fees and defense? So even if you truly were acting in self-defense, you're still going to have to hire an attorney to prove that. And I live down here in Sanford, Florida, and one of the things we're famous for in Sanford is the George Zimmerman and Trayvon Martin case. I'm sure all of you know what I'm talking about. Now, whether you like him, hate him, agree, disagree, I don't care. What the point here is, is how did the court of law find George Zimmerman? And the answer is they found him not guilty. But what most people don't realize is how much his attorney's fees were to be found not guilty. It was a little over two and a half million dollars to be found not guilty. 
So even if whatever you're doing is completely in the right and it's deemed that you were acting in self-defense, it could still bankrupt you and your family to get to that point. How about your reputation? If you end up on the six o'clock news, I, I hate to say it, but in our society now, the innocent until proven guilty is gone. Basically, you are hung out to dry on the news and social media first, and then it's up to you and your attorney to prove that you were in the right. And a lot of times, especially in a job like ours, where our reputation is so important, we may never recover from that. By the way, who, is, who will hire George Zimmerman? Nobody. And you actually could end up in jail. There's plenty of stories. Um, I am a firearms instructor, so I keep up on a lot of the different stories of times where a firearm was used in self-defense and what happened in court. And there are several stories of people that are in jail still trying to appeal on cases that what looks on the surface like a cut and dry self-defense, however, they've been sitting in jail for years trying to prove that. So, and I don't want you to get stuck on the firearm aspect of this. There's lots of things. What if a bad guy comes at me and I've learned a little bit of self-defense, so I kick him and I push him to get him away from me and he trips and falls and cracks his head open on the sidewalk and dies? Was it self-defense or was it manslaughter? Unfortunately, that's up to the courts to decide and they may not see it the same way that we see it. So even something as simple as pushing somebody, you could end up in jail. And that's pretty scary to think about that. So we try to avoid the fight whenever we can. So one of, I like to, if we absolutely knew what the bad guy was looking for in a victim, I would do everything I could to not look like that. If they have, if they have a perfect victim they're looking for, let's not look like that. And as a quick little aside, I say bad guys, but I want you to realize it could be bad guy, it could be bad girl, it could be bad kid, it could be bad old person, it does not matter. They have kids as young as eight or nine years old now that are actually in, in detention for murdering other kids. They have, I always joke, you could be 80 years old, but if your brain is still the brain of a criminal, maybe you just got out of jail after 50 years, you're still a criminal. You may look like a harmless old grandma or grandpa, but your brain is still a criminal. So don't prejudge anybody based on what they look like. But bad guys is just kind of an easier thing to say. So don't look like a target. A target is somebody who's going to be very weak, very subservient, will do whatever the bad guy says to do and doesn't fight back. We can show that through our posture. So if you're very hunched over, you don't have confident posture, your head is down, you're looking at your feet, you're not making eye contact with people, that shows somebody that is weak and most likely subservient and will be a very good victim. On the flip side, somebody whose head is up, shoulders are back, you're walking with a purpose, you're walking like you have a place to go and you have meaning, and you're looking around, being observant and making eye contact with people so you see them and they know you see them. And this has nothing to do with your size, this has everything to do with your attitude. So everybody close your eyes for just a second. I want you to picture somebody in your life they're probably about 80 pounds soaking wet. And you just look at them and go, you know, nobody's ever messed with you, have they? We all have somebody like that. Okay. Close your eyes again. Somebody in your life, you look at them and you go, how are you still alive? You got somebody? Okay. What's the difference between those two people? It's their attitude. Remember I said I'm never gonna blame the victim, but we also don't wanna make ourselves an easy target. And if you continuously go stupid places with stupid people doing stupid things, you are more likely to be victimized. So we need to pay attention to that. So think about your attitude, think about your posture, 
and think about your dress. And what I mean here is not she was wearing a mini skirt, she deserved it. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is what you are wearing when you are out showing houses or on listing appointments. Could you run if you had to? Could you fight if you had to? Could you kick if you had to? Could you run downstairs? Could you run upstairs? And I see some women that come to class wearing these ridiculously high-heeled shoes. And when I get to this part of class, they always say, oh, well, I'll just kick them off and run. The average attack takes between three and 10 seconds. You cannot kick off your shoes and run in three seconds. And remember what I said earlier, you may not even know you're being attacked until somebody's already sucker punched you from the back. The last thing that is going to be on your mind is kicking off your shoes. If they're a kind that even can kick off, if they've got straps like these in the picture, those take a few minutes to get off. So you can still look cute in a pair of flats, in a pair of loafers, in a pair of ballet slippers. Wear a pantsuit or wear a loose skirt that you could actually run or kick in as opposed to a tight pencil skirt. You can still look very professional, but still have in the back of your mind what you're wearing could make it harder for you to defend yourself. Now, that being said, I know some of you are not going to change the way that you dress, and that is totally fine. We've got to work around for that. If you are going to do something that you know makes you a harder, an easier target and harder for you to fight back, you have to be even more diligent on your paying attention so you can avoid the situations to start with. So for example, I had knee surgery a few years ago and I walked with a limp for a while. You know, first I had the crutches and then you move off of the crutches and you still have the limp for a while. All those fun things that we have when we have injuries and surgery. So when I, for starters, I would not go to grocery stores if I could avoid it. I would text him the shopping list and tell him to stop on the way home. So I would avoid situations that could put me in danger. But if I was out, I paid even more attention. Instead of paying attention to maybe a 30 feet circle around me, I started paying attention to a 50 or 60 feet circle around me. I paid more attention because I knew I was going to need more lead time to get away if something started to go down. So you can still dress like that. You can still wear the sexy shoes. I'm six foot tall. I don't need those shoes. In fact, Tim yells at me when I wear them because I'm already just a smidge taller than him anyway. But if you're going to do it, just know you've got to pay more attention because you need more response time than somebody not in high heels. So office security. What I want you to do, and obviously we don't have time to do that now, but I really want you to spend about five or 10 minutes and sit down with a blank piece of paper and just make notes. What do you do in your office now? What security protocols are in place? Are there cameras? What kind of door locks are used? Were the locks changed after the last agent got fired or quit? That's a scary one because a lot of people don't change the locks. Do you have an emergency system? Do you have a code word system? Do you have a panic button in your office somewhere? Do you have a pepper spray mounted in your office anywhere? How is the back door secured? Do people prop the back door open while they're out on their smoke break? So pay attention to what's happening in your office policy now. Maybe even go to your broker and ask, what are some of the safety things we have in place? And then think about what you can do. So maybe you could start a safety committee in your office. Maybe you have a safety liaison, a person that's in charge of bringing things back to the office. Maybe you have reminders at your sales meetings. So on a weekly basis, if you have regular sales meetings, maybe your broker or your safety committee is sharing little one or two minute tips. Maybe you're posting safety tips in your private company emails or your private company, and this is inner office, I mean, like when the broker sends out emails to everybody. Or maybe you have a private office Facebook group and they can post tips and alerts and warnings. Uh, we've had a, some cases here in Orlando just recently where there's a, a gentleman 
everybody knows his name and his picture has been shared many, many times. It actually was an official alert put out by our board. So post those types of things in emails to your agents and post those things in your private company Facebook groups. Because it would be really awful if our board sent out an alert, but one of your agents just didn't see it and set an appointment with this dude and something happened. So what can you do? And I really want you to think about that. It's, it, if you're in an office where recruiting is an important part of your business, having a safety plan in place will help you with recruiting too. Because a lot of people don't realize that real estate is dangerous, or if they do, they're looking for a place that cares about their safety. Okay, let's talk about some things that we can do differently. And first, let's talk right off the bat about what we can do in our marketing. So my, uh, my college degree is actually in marketing, so it's kind of funny. No matter what kind of class you take with me, you're gonna learn some marketing tips too. So in our marketing, do not, do not put your home phone or home address anywhere if it can be avoided. So depending on your state, use a P.O. box or use one of the little mailboxes, et cetera, stores, whatever you want. Even my license, if you go to the Florida licensing webpage and pull me up, it shows my P.O. box. Again, if somebody really wants to figure out where I live, they're gonna figure it out. But I don't need to take out a billboard on the side of the street and say, here's where my home address is. So any place we can hide it, do it. If you are a landlord and have leases with customers, Use a P.O. box on your leases, not your home address. Do not ever have your tenant bring rent to your house. I know that sounds basic, but I have a friend that does it, and it just, it freaks me out. I'm not doing it. How about our social media? Here's the thing with social media. Social media is absolutely here to stay, especially in our industry. However, social media is also used by predators to target people. So we need to find that fine line of sharing on, on social media, but not sharing too much. So people will do business with people they know, like, and trust. And on Facebook, a lot of times, in fact, maybe it's already happened to you. How many of you have taken a, an online friendship and it's now an offline friendship. So you met somebody online, maybe in your mommy's group, or in my case, I'm, I'm active in a couple of different realtor groups. And we've taken that offline and we're now offline friends as well. We talk on the phone, we go out for cocktails and, you know, things that adults do. People do business they, with people they know, like, and trust. And social media is the perfect platform to show people why they can like us, why they can trust us, and get to know us. And one of the ways that that's done is through affinity. So people like people that are like them. And I know it sounds stupid, but every time I post a picture of my dogs, I get a bajillion comments. Oh, you have a black lab, I have a black lab. Oh, that's so wonderful. Will you list my house? And we laugh, but that really is how it happens. You have an orange kitty cat? I have an orange kitty cat. Will you list my house? If people don't know a real estate agent, they typically, and I forget the exact numbers, but I think it's like 60 something percent, will use the first agent they talk to. So whatever tool we can use to make us the first agent they can talk to, you're gonna win that customer most of the time. So they like things like pets. They like things like uh, activities, going to the beach, playing softball, coaching your kid's volleyball team. All of those things that are a little bit of your personal life makes them know, like, and trust you even more. Now, the flip side of that is we don't want to give them too much information. So, for example, on June 21st, when all y'all are going to go onto Facebook and tell me happy birthday next year, I'm just going to say thank you, but it's not my real birthday. Your birthday is one of the things that you use to log into like different uh, credit card accounts and bank accounts and stuff. So I'm not telling anybody what my real birthday is. 
it's close enough that people that know me don't even think anything about it, but it's not my real birthday. The other thing, and I love it, I love when people post, well, I don't love it, I hate it, but it's what keeps me in business. Hey, just leaving on a one week cruise, see you later. You just told the whole world your house is empty for the next seven days, along with the three friends that you tagged in the post that are going with you on the cruise. So there's four houses I can go rob while you're gone. How about just got back from a cruise? Did you miss us? You're still sharing the same thing. You're just sharing it after the fact. So I do want you to share. That's what people, oh, we went on a cruise too. We loved it so much. Maybe we'll go together next year. Another one that I've seen, and I, you maybe seen this, you've seen this too, and this one scares me. Hey, hanging out at the open house at 123 Main Street. I'm all by myself from one to four. Stop by and see me. Hmm, think about that. I'm all by myself in this beautiful house that you just showed me a picture of with cool stuff on the walls that I can probably steal. You told me the address and you told me exactly what time you're going to be there. How about come see us at the open house and now people know that you're not alone. Even if you are alone, I still say us because it throws some people off. Remember, nothing is going to make you 100% safe, but if we can add all these little things together, it's going to make you safer. By the way, the black one is Artie. She's, a, she's about six years old, female black lab. And the other one is Gator. He's a puppy. He's about 13 weeks. And he's a lab Catahoula mix. And he's a monster already, as you can see from that picture. I'm actually surprised he's being quiet. I'm surprised we haven't heard him squalling yet. Never trust a quiet puppy, right? So in our marketing, let's talk about photos and ads. A lot of times our advertising and the pictures we're using in our, in our ads, in our social media, on our business cards, it used to be I told people, don't put your picture on your business cards. But nowadays the business cards, is such, that's such a small part of our marketing. You're going to find pictures of me somewhere. You're going to go to my Instagram. You're going to go to my Facebook. You're going to go to my LinkedIn. You're going to find pictures of me. So we need to be very aware of what pictures we're using and what message they're sending. So Inman actually did a story just, uh, I don't know, a week ago. Does sexy sell real estate? And this is something that we all need to be thinking about. We need to think about what message our pictures are sending. So for example, do we look overly sexy? Do we have a lot of jewelry on? If a bad guy is trying to decide who to pick, one that's dripping in jewels leaning up against a jaguar would be a very good market. Hey, come meet me at this vacant house and make sure you drive that car and wear all that jewelry too. We're going to call it Uber delivery for criminals. What do you think? Bring your jewelry, bring your car. In fact, bring some money too. Leaning against an expensive car. Too alluring or too sultry can send the wrong message. Now, when um, Beverly Carter, who is the agent that was killed in Arkansas a few years back, when they finally caught the guy that killed her, as they were shoving his head down into the squad car, one of the reporters asked him, why did you pick her? And his answer was, because she was a rich broker. We try to make ourselves look rich. We try to make ourselves look successful. We drive flashy cars, we wear flashy clothes, we carry flashy purses, we carry flashy watches. We're trying to make ourselves look more successful than we are. And a lot of times that's all a front. It's all on Visa because we can pay for it over the next 20 years. But the bad guys don't know that. They assume that we're all in real estate buying and selling million dollar houses, even though that's not really what happens. So they see us as a good target. So we need to pay attention to that. Let's talk about what to do when meeting a customer for the first time. So the very first time you meet a customer, the absolute best, best, best place to meet them is at your office. You're bringing them to your turf, your territory. It's your place of strength. 
your name tag has the same logo as the building. It's my turf. When they walk in, maybe I have cameras, maybe I have welcome, maybe we have a receptionist that introduces themselves and gets a copy of their driver's license. All this fun stuff happens at our office. The challenge is if the listing that they want to see is an hour away from my office, nobody's going to drive to my office just to turn around and drive an hour to get to the listing. So the next best place is some of you may have offices across town closer to the listing. Even if it's not your same franchise owner, maybe if it's not the same broker, it doesn't matter. My name tag logo and the building logo still match, so it looks like it's my turf, and we should all be working together. After that, the next best after that, how about your mortgage company or your title company? Maybe they have an office over closer to the listing. Trust me, your mortgage company has zero problem with you meeting a new prospect in their conference room for 10 minutes. In fact, then you can get mortgage questions answered if you have any. And a pre-approved buyer is also a safer buyer for you. Somebody's already vetted them. If there's not any of those places close to your listing, that's when we go to um, Starbucks, Panera, McDonald's, some type of a public place. Remember, they probably have cameras going. We're meeting at a public place. And what I want you to do is as soon as you walk up to somebody in the Panera parking lot, oh, hey, you must be John. I'm Andy. Yeah, we've got a couple of really great houses to see. Let's go inside and sit down for just a couple minutes. I want to kind of go over what you're looking for and what your process is going to be and what your time frame is, what kind of house you're looking for. Just get to know a little better what you're looking for. And, oh, by the way, do you have your driver's license with you? I just need to take a quick picture of it and text it back to the office. Now, everybody should have their driver's license with them because they drove to wherever you're meeting them. In fact, let's talk about that in just a second. The never best place is meeting at the house. And according to the National Association of Realtors Safety Survey, 50% of us are still meeting them at the house for the first time. And that's way, way, way too high of a number. So let's talk about the driver's license for a quick second. I have a lot of people that really, really resist this and they say, well, what if I ask for their driver's license and they don't wanna give it to me, so they go somewhere else? Well, maybe they weren't a real customer to start with. I want you to think about that. Have you ever gotten one of those phone calls from a prospect and it sounds something like this? I want to see your listing. Okay, great. Are you pre-approved? Don't worry about it. I'm good. I'm paying cash. Do you have proof of funds? Don't worry about it. I'm all good. I got the money. Don't worry. Yeah, you're laughing because you've gotten those phone calls before. How many of those actually ever closed? Probably zero. Um, I ask that question every time I teach a class, and in the last several years, I've had maybe three people say they actually closed one of those. So for the most part, those are not real buyers. If they won't give you a pre-approval, and they won't give you proof of funds, and they won't give you a driver's license, they're probably not a real customer, so next. But here's a few things I want you to think about. Number one, your seller thinks you're vetting people before you bring them into their house. Just saying. Number two, how many of you have bought a car in the last 20 years? Exactly. What did they ask for? We actually just bought a new Jeep about two weeks ago. And when you are a tire kicker, when you're not serious, and somebody says, do you have any questions about this car? You say, no, we're just looking. Leave us alone. But when you are ready to buy, you walk up to them, you hand them your driver's license, your insurance card, say, here you go, can we test drive it? And, oh, do you need my payoff? Let me call my bank and see what my payoff is. When you are a serious buyer, isn't that what you do? Because we just did it two weeks ago. If you're serious, you'll give them a driver's license. If you know anybody who's tried to rent an apartment in the last couple years, they will not show you the apartment model without a driver's license. 
and every person in your party must have a driver's license or they get to stay in the lobby while the rest of you go look at it and they keep your license until you come back from the showing so it's normal in the car industry it's normal in the apartment industry why are we still fighting it now one big caveat here if you are going to ask for id you must ask for id 100 percent of the time because if you ask a male for their ID, but you don't ask a female, fair housing discrimination. If you asked Mr. Gonzalez for his ID, but you didn't ask Mr. Smith for his, that could be a fair housing discrimination. So you've got to do it 100% of the time consistently. Let's give you a few tips on showing vacant houses. So for starters, lock up when you leave. Um, if you've ever found a house that has a back door open, that could have been an oversight on somebody's part, but it also could be an agent that specializes in working with investors has come and opened up the house and then texted all his investors and said, the back door's open, go look at it. Um, I ran the real estate investing associations. There's two different ones here in Orlando. I ran them for 15 out of the last 18 years. And I know all the tricks that the investors do. So when I leave, it's locked up. If I have to go show the property to my investors, then so does he. How do you show a house? How we've been trained to show a house is we walk to the front door, we open the lockbox, we walk in, we flip on all the light switches we can reach, and if there's a curtain right there, we go ahead and open it to get some light in the house. Then we walk around, we show them the kitchen, we show them the bedroom, we show them everything. Then we go out the back door and we look around the back and the outside. What I want you to do is just flip flop that. I want you to show the outside first. I want you to walk around the perimeter and you're looking for signs of forced entry. You're looking for broken windows, sliding glass doors off the track, uh, back doors that have been kicked open. When law enforcement responds to a call and they find a house with a door open, they do not go in until backup arrives. So if law enforcement won't go in, why would you? Think about that. I had somebody tell me once they found a ladder to a open second story window in a vacant house once. Don't go in if you find that. That's not a good sign. So I want you to show the outside first, then go inside. When you do go in, announce your entry. I want you to knock really loud. Knock, knock, knock. Open the door. Hello. We're here for our four o'clock appointment. What you just said is we're here, means there's more than one of us. Even if I'm alone previewing a house, I still say we're here. And four o'clock appointment says, and somebody knows we're here. Now, the minute you say that, I want you to shut your mouth and listen. You're listening for footsteps, doors opening and closing. If it's a two-story house, you're listening for maybe floorboard creaks, anything that would tell you somebody is in there. Now, if it's not a vacant house, I still want you to do this, even if you have an appointment. Because a lot of times you have an appointment with the parents, but they forgot to tell their teenage son. And I'll just let you use your imagination about the kind of things that I've had agents tell me they walked in on when the teenage son didn't know you were coming. Anybody giggling right about now? Exactly. Maybe it's happened to you. It's no fun. So announce your entry on all houses. Squatters. What do you do? Well, I have found squatters before. I've also found lots of evidence of squatters. I've found um, drug use paraphernalia in vacant houses. I found condoms in vacant houses. We found a gun once in a house, um, in a vacant house. Tim, my husband, Tim, goes and looks at investment properties with me sometimes. He's in the mortgage business, so we kind of work together a lot. But we found a rifle up in the closet of a vacant house. And Tim, like, is all touching it because he's, he's an instructor with me, too. He's a, he's a firearms guy. So he's all looking at it and touching it. And, and all of a sudden, I grab it from him, and I take my T-shirt, and I start wiping it all down, and I throw it back up in the closet. And I'm like, we don't need your fingerprints all over it. I don't know where it came from, but I don't want Tim's fingerprints all over it. So if you find squatters, if they threaten you or attack you in any way, call 911. If they do not threaten you, which is more likely what happens, usually they're 
they're just trying to get out of the rain or get out of the cold. What I want you to do is call the listing agent and let them handle it. It is not your listing, it's not your job, it's not your house. Uh, do you really wanna be subpoenaed next year in on a case against this person? Probably not. Besides, it takes forever for police to come and fill out reports and stuff. So call the listing agent. Now, as the listing agent, if you've just been told that there's a squatter in your house, the first thing I want you to do is call the owner and find out. Maybe the owner told their nephew they could crash there for spring break or something. So before you start calling the police on people, make sure it really is a squatter and it's not somebody that had permission to be in the house. You never know. And if, they, if there are squatters, the best thing to happen is for the owner to open up the police case because this could be ongoing. There could have to be evictions. There could be insurance claims. There could be all kinds of things that are going to stem off of this squatter, and it really should be the owner involved with it. Now, if the owner is not local and you are their listing agent and they ask you to handle it for them, that's part of what you get to do. You get to handle it for them. So that's, that's the joys of being an agent sometimes. That's why we get paid the big bucks, right? If you ever get that gut feeling, I want you to listen to it. I want you to pay attention to it. Okay? Do not ignore it. Animals all have the gut feeling. It's our internal alarm system. Humans are the only ones that not only purposely ignore it, but we justify why we ignored it. Well, I had a bad feeling, but I didn't want to make a scene. I didn't want to make a fool out of myself. I didn't want to ask too many questions. I didn't want to jeopardize my commission. Trust your gut feeling. It's usually right. Show property in the daytime when you can. There could be different dangers. There could be um, like broken floorboards, broken tiles, steps that you can't see at night, broken hand railings. So it's a safety, remember we had 120 agents die from slips, trips, and falls in the last 10 years on the job. So let's not make it easier to slip, trip, and fall. And this is coming from a klutz that I will trip over a long blade of grass if there's one in my way. So I have to be extra careful, I know that. So that was vacant. Let's talk about all properties in general. Get out of the closet. And what I mean by that is I don't ever wanna see and I see it on some of these TV shows about finding houses and it's ridiculous. The agent walks all the way to the back of the giant walk-in closet and says, wow, look how big this closet is. You just walked into a trap. One door in, one door out, and you walked into it willingly. They didn't even need to put a carrot in the trap for you. You walked in willingly. So don't do that. How about standing outside and saying, look how big that closet is. In fact, stand way back in the hallway and say, look how big that master bedroom is. In fact, on vacant houses, I like to stand at the front door and just open it up and say, have at it. I'll be here if you have any questions. Which, by the way, is what your customer prefers. We can't do that in an occupied house. We've got some duty to make sure they're not stealing. But do not, in a vacant house, just let them at it. But do not trap yourself in a small space. Closets, basements, attics, bathrooms, they're all super, super bad ideas. Here in Florida a couple years ago, we had three attacks on real estate agents down in the Tampa area, all within a two-week period. It ends up it was two different bad guys. It just was coincidence that they targeted three different realtors in about a two-week period. But in one of them, the guy went into the bathroom looked under the sink and said, hey, come here, does this look like a plumbing leak? And the agent came in to look and that's when he attacked her because he had trapped her in a small space. Now, I don't know about you, but I am not a licensed plumber. So if my customer asks me, hey, does this look like a plumbing leak? My answer should be, I don't know. I'm not a plumber. Now, I've been flipping houses for about 20 years, so I really can tell you usually what's wrong with stuff because I've paid for enough replums and stuff over the years. But if I tell a customer, oh, no, no, that's like a $3 pipe part and it's fixed, it's no big deal, and they buy this house, and then a week later it comes out that it needs replumbing and it's going to cost $3,000, who are they going to blame and who are they going to sue? 
well, our realtor, Andy, said it was a $3 fix, and now it's $3,000, so let's sue her. And guess who's paying for their new plumbing? Probably their realtor, Andy. So the better thing to say is, I don't know, I'm not a plumber. However, if you like the house, we'll make sure we have an inspection period written into the offer. And if the inspector finds a plumbing problem, then we can go back to the seller and we can either renegotiate or we can back out and find another house or get it fixed. Isn't that the better answer? Don't do what's outside of the scope of your license. Who leads? Do not ever let somebody get behind you. They could be walking down the hallway behind you pulling out duct tape and handcuffs and a knife and you don't even know it because they're behind you. So let them go first. I want you to think of the, the Vanna White wave after you. I don't need to see the master bedroom. I'm not going to be living here. Don't ever let them get behind you. It's a very dangerous place to be. And that's everywhere. You know, people have their personal space, your, your little zone that you don't like other people to get into. And even simple as you're in line at the grocery store and the person gets too close behind you in line, pay attention to that. That's not normal. I want you to just move a little so you can, so they're not behind you, so they're next to you. Then you have a little bit of a heads up that you can pay attention to what's coming. Herding cats. Have any of you ever walked into a listing and Mr. Buyer goes to the left and Mrs. Buyer goes to the right and they split up on you? In a vacant house, that's fine, but in an occupied house, you have to be careful because you can only follow one of them and they know that. So one of them might be the distraction while the other one is supposed to be going to see if they can find prescription drugs, see if they can find jewelry, see if they can find cash. So an easy way of this is just to politely say, oh, I'm sorry, our office policy is we need to stay together when we're showing occupied properties. And a true buyer is just going to fall into place and go, okay, cool, sorry, didn't know. If they put up a fuss about being together, that should be a red flag for you. Always, always, always trust your gut feelings. If you're truly getting a gut feeling that's bad about your customer, I would rather you get out of the house and go lock yourself in your car and call for help than stay in the house with them. Everything in the house is replaceable except you. So remember that. Pay attention to their body language. Um, I actually teach a whole class now just on, on reading body language and knowing when somebody's up to no good. So they should not be nervous when they're looking at a house. They shouldn't be fidgety. They shouldn't be twiddling their fingers. They shouldn't be pacing. They shouldn't be bobbing. They shouldn't be sweating unless you're down here in Florida like we are, I don't know. It's like December and we're still sweating, right? But pay attention to their body language. If they're not making eye contact, if their breathing is shallower, if their eyes have dilated. Remember we talked earlier about the fight or flight response and I said the bad guy knows what's happening before you do. So their physiological responses have kicked in before yours. That's what we're talking about here. They should not be nervous when looking at houses. Now, closing, that's a whole different story. A lot of them are, are nervous at closing. In fact, I got a closing still today that I got to get off to, and he's already texting me questions. <laughs> lock it up tight when you leave. Have you ever had a property and you just can't get the sliding glass door to lock when you leave, and you try, and your customer tries? I want you to call and report that to the agent. In fact, report anything you find to the listing agent. A lot of people are always wondering why real estate professionals are so far down on the list of professionalism. And unfortunately, one of the answers is because we do really stupid things that aren't professional. So a couple of years ago when, when Florida's foreclosure problem was so big, um, I went to look at a property. It was for myself. I was looking at it for an investment. It was a bank owned. And when I went into the master bathroom, there was a leak. Now, I've been flipping houses long enough, I can tell a leak that just happened this morning or has been there a while. This one had a giant puddle on the floor, a big hole in the ceiling where the drywall had collapsed, and there was already black mold growing up the wall. So this didn't happen in last night's storm. This has been going for a while. 
So I called the listing agent up and I said, um, you need to check out 123 Main Street. You've got a pretty bad roof leak in the master bathroom. And he said, thank you. Six agents have shown that house in the last two days. You're the only one that called and reported that. If it was your listing, wouldn't you want somebody to tell you? If it was your house, wouldn't you want somebody to tell your agent? So something that might have been a $300 fix if you catch it early enough is now maybe a $30,000 fix because now you got to do a full mold remediation too. Report anything you find back to the listing agent. It's not hard. Most of us get little texts anyway that says, are you done with the showing? Do you want to leave feedback? Just respond back, leak in bathroom. Let them figure out why. Okay. Um, personal safety devices. There's, there's a lot of misinformation out there. And we're, we're basically, we're going to be wrapping up now. I just wanted to touch on personal safety devices for a minute. Um, get educated. I see so much misinformation in the marketplace about what you can and can't carry, what you can and can't do, and what works and what doesn't work. So for example, a stun gun does not knock somebody out unconscious and they wake up 30 minutes later tied to a chair in the basement. That is Hollywood. That is TV world. That is not real world. What a stun gun... What a stun gun does is just repels the body momentarily and by, gets you time to run away. So if you've ever gone to unplug something from the wall and you accidentally touch your finger to the plug and your hand kind of got thrown back, that's what a stun gun does. Most electricians are not injured because they touch the wires. They're injured because they touch the wires and it threw them off the ladder. Okay. So a stun gun, we call it stun and run. It's just buying time. But the truth is a lot of bad guys, just the sound of a stun gun will turn them off. Because remember, they're looking for an easy victim. They're looking for somebody that's not going to fight back. And if you show through your body language and your posturing and zapping a stun gun in the air, that's going to turn a lot of them away. Uh, pepper spray is another thing. I love pepper spray. I carry one on my keychain. A pepper spray, it, you may not realize that it works on dogs too. So I don't know about you, but many times in my 20 year real estate career, I have found dogs in houses where dogs were not supposed to be. So pepper spray does work on dogs. It is, most of them nowadays have a UV dye in them or a colored dye. So whoever you've sprayed is now marked for the law enforcement officers to find them. Um, Pepper spray is actually made from hot peppers. It's called OC spray or oleoresin capsicum, which is the hotness that's in jalapenos. So for example, a jalapeno pepper, if you've ever cut a pepper and then accidentally touched your eye or, or touched your nose or your mouth, it burns a little bit, right? A jalapeno is between 3,000 and 8,000 Scoville heat units, SHUs. That's how they measure the hotness of peppers. So 3,000 to 8,000. The average commercial pepper spray is anywhere from 500,000 to 3 million. And you're spraying it directly in somebody's eyes, nose, or mouth. You're hitting those mucous membranes and they immediately, their eyes slam shut and their throat starts to close and they can't breathe. It's instantaneous. And while they're doing that, you get away. Remember everything we said at the beginning, we're only fighting enough to get away. Everything is about buying us a little window of opportunity to get away. It's not about incapacitating them for hours. It's about just getting them, distracting them just enough that we can get away or showing that they picked a, a really, really bad target today. It was a, you picked a bad day. Um, there's a lot of different local laws about what you can and can't do, so you need to get educated on that. One thing that I highly, highly, highly recommend is getting a self-defense class. Taking a, f listen, you don't have to go to karate five times a week to be proficient in self-defense, but you also can't have taken a class back when you were 16 in high school and expect to remember that when you need it. Uh, if you train 
once a month or even once a quarter, that is probably going to be enough for you to remember a lot of the basic moves when the time comes. So find a local self-defense school or somebody that puts on classes and find out what their schedule is. A lot of times your police department will put on a class. It's called the SAFE, S-A-F-E, and it's actually sponsored by the National Self-Defense Institute. It's put on by your local law enforcement agencies, typically. I'm also certified to teach it here in Florida. And it is a two-hour class. It is one hour of awareness and paying attention, some of what we've talked today. And then it's one hour of actually some hands-on, simple self-defense moves. It is very basic, but it is better than nothing. And a lot of times that's a free class. One of the challenges that class by rule of the National Self-Defense Institute is a ladies only class. There's also classes, um, mock rape classes. There are uh, RAD, R-A-D is another one that's really good. In fact, there's RAD kids too. And people ask me how young is too young for somebody to start learning this? And the answer is anytime. There's scary stuff already happening in middle school. So it's, it's never too early to start thinking about learning self-defense, learning awareness. If you've got kids that are out with you, start playing games with them about awareness. Have them point out the creepy guy on the bench that's looking at you funny. Have them pay attention. When you walk into a restaurant, ask them how many exits there are. Where's the closest exit? Where would we leave if something happened? Where's the closest fire extinguisher? Have them just start, and I, you know, today we we're talking mostly about personal safety, like avoiding physical attacks. But we already talked about 120 agents died from slips, trips, and falls. We need to obviously pay a little more attention to that. 118 died in car accidents. We need to pay attention to that. Uh, put your phone away. And by the way, if any of you are literal like me, I see the signs that say don't text and drive. And I say, well, I'm not texting. I'm on Facebook. It's totally different. <laughs> I'm a very literal person like that. So, but it's, it's temp, you know, your phone goes off and you're waiting on a contract to come through and you take a look at it. But all it takes is a quick glance away from the road and something happens. Because if you're glancing this way and the other car is glancing that way, all of a sudden you guys are glancing each other and you got to be careful of that. There's so many things out there. And one of the things that I really try to stress in my classes is I'm not trying to get you to completely change your whole lifestyle. I'm not trying to turn you into Rambo. I just want you to see that there's simple little tweaks you can make that can protect you and your family without changing your lifestyle. I'm not saying don't go out and have fun. Don't, don't go to the movies. Don't go to restaurants. Don't go to the beach. I'm not saying that. I'm saying go to all those places. Just pay attention and be prepared for what could happen. You know, I live in Orlando. We've got annual passes to a bunch of the theme parks. I go to the theme parks a lot. Um, I take friends with me to theme parks that think they're totally safe until I start pointing things out to them. And they're like, Oh, I thought we were safe here. I'm like, you are, if you're paying attention, but it's, you know, I'm, I'm not a paranoid person. Actually, if anything, I'm teaching you from all my, all the mistakes I've made. It's a wonder I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been absolutely, um, well, what's the right word for it? it? It almost makes me nervous, all of the things that I hadn't thought about. And um, I'm sure a lot of the people watching today might feel the same. It's like, oh, wow, that makes so much sense now that you've mentioned it to us. So talk about practical. Um, so for Realtor Safety Month, I, I hope that this has been a, a good kickstart to everybody's month. Just Let's stay safe out there. This is about you. This is about your families. This is about your clients. And Andy, thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. Um, we are really excited to have you back in a couple short weeks. I'm going to give my short little shameless plug. Um, the Real Estate Technology Institute, we're here to, to make sure that you have all the tips and tricks and tools um, to be able to leverage technology in a safe way. Sometimes, um, there is 
well, a safe way, an effective way. Um, effective is normally our cause, but for the month of, or for September and Realtor Safety Month, digital safety is also very important. Today, Andy focused on our physical safety. Um, we will be talking about some things with digital safety as well in the next couple weeks. Uh, we do host these webinars once a week on Wednesday afternoons. Please consider becoming a uh, member at reti.us. That's reti.us. We can't continue to offer these complimentary webinars unless we have the members there to support it. So please consider it. You have we have hundreds, if not thousands, of uh, tutorials and training videos and webinars and really a, a lot of just fantastic content on any type of technology that you might be interested in. But that being said, I'm going to leave Andy one last opportunity. Are, is there anything that you'd like um, viewers today to go and check out? Saferagent.com. Are there any places that you'd uh, consider as resources for today's uh, participants? Um, Saferagent.com is actually under a complete overhaul, and we're going to get ready to launch that really soon. So don't judge us by what's there right now. We're working on some cool stuff. Some on, The online training is getting ready to launch and some fun things. Um, follow us on Facebook, Safer Agent. Instagram, Safer Agent. I share all kinds of different tips and alerts and stuff out there. And the biggest thing, especially as agents, you spend a fortune on leads. You spend a fortune on marketing. You spend a fortune going to seminars to learn about scripts and what to say and how to hire agents and all, how to have an amazing business and none of that matters if you don't come home. Wow. That's uh, you're 100% right. That's uh, some really important advice that we just got. So everybody, thank you again, Andy. Thank you everybody for joining today. Um, that being said, if you need to get in touch, saferagent.com um, and follow them on Facebook and Instagram as well. So I'm going to, I'm easy to find. <laughs> <laughs> do as I say, not as I do, right? Exactly. All right, everybody. I hope you have a great afternoon. Take care. Bye, guys. <laughs>